When we think of Australia, most of us think first of the kangaroo, perhaps the very symbol of the land down under. But Australia is home to more than just kangaroos. This self-contained biological laboratory boasts a fascinating array of unusual animals. How did they get here? What is so special about this island continent? Part of the answer lies in the country's remoteness, its geographic separation from the rest of the world. Australia has evolved in sea-bound isolation for some 50 million years. Its wildlife relatively undisturbed by influences from the outside. But the world as we know it today does not hold all the answers to Australia's past. We must look to a distant time in the Earth's geological history when the continents were joined. Scientists believe that somewhere in the continents we know today as the Americas, Antarctica and Australia the earliest marsupials evolved. When the land mass split apart, the continents carried their life forms with them. However, in South America, predators and competitors for food eventually wiped out a great number of marsupial species. In Antarctica, they froze out of existence. Only in Australia, safely cut off from competitors, could these creatures continue to evolve and flourish virtually undisturbed for millions of years. When the first Europeans began settling here around 200 years ago, they could scarcely believe their eyes. Nowhere else had they seen animals like these. The kangaroos still fascinate scientists and tourists alike. Kangaroos, like most marsupials, carry and nurture their immature young in pouches. Babies, called joeys, spend the first six months or more suckling in the pouch. Even after they have left, they return frequently for shelter and transportation. There are about 50 species of kangaroo in Australia. Some are as small as a rat. Others are two meters tall. Some kangaroos live in trees, while others are more comfortable bounding across rocky slopes. But one trait they all share is that they hop. A large kangaroo can cover up to nearly eight meters in one leap. Its leg muscles and tendons are like the spring of a pogo stick storing energy, which is released without effort when the kangaroo next pushes off. The eucalyptus forests of eastern Australia are home to another famous marsupial, the popular and appealing koala. On the ground, only to move from tree to tree, the koala spends almost all its time high in the branches. It has developed specialized adaptations for life in the trees. Long arms, well-padded paws, and opposable thumbs with a vice-like grip. Eucalyptus trees provide more than just shelter. This is the koala's primary food source. It eats about one kilogram of leaves a day. Despite superficial resemblance, the so-called koala bear is not a bear at all, but a marsupial like the kangaroo. After birth, the young will stay in the mother's pouch for about six months. Even when strong enough to leave the pouch, the 
baby will do so only intermittently. For the next few months, it will travel everywhere with its mother, clinging either to her back or chest. The koala has inspired many different reactions over the centuries. Some observers find in this animal a resemblance to a maiden ant, aloof and dignified. But the Aborigines saw something quite different. To these first residents of Australia, the koala represented the reincarnation of the spirits of lost children. Although the koala and the kangaroo are no doubt the most famous marsupials, Australia boasts as many as 150 species of pouched animals. The ferocious looking Tasmanian devil is one of the few that eats mostly meat. It's easy to imagine the astonishment of early explorers when they saw a pouched animal take to the air. These gliding marsupials do not actually fly like birds, but a kite-like membrane enables them to glide for distances of nearly 40 meters. Western Australia is the only remaining range for the numbat, a small, gentle marsupial which is now extinct in other parts of the country. The numbat exists on a diet of termites, which it roots out with its sharp claws and captures with its long, sinuous, sticky tongue. With its distinctive bands of white and its bottle brush tail, the numbat gets many votes as Australia's most beautifully marked marsupial. Beauty fills the skies of Australia also. More than 300 species of birds are unique to her shores. These birds add a generous dash of color and grace to the Australian environment. From the depths of the forest echoes a haunting and memorable sound, the lyrebird, master of vocal mimicry. The lyrebird's seemingly endless repertoire includes man-made sounds as well as a host of bird calls. In the reptile world, Australia stands out as the continent with the largest proportion of venomous snakes. The death adder is one of the country's most poisonous snakes. Without treatment, half of its human victims die. Like all snakes, the death adder feeds primarily on small animals like lizards. Its approach is neither timid nor aggressive. For in the end, it relies on an extraordinary device for enticing its prey to venture closer. Wriggling the tip of its tail as a lure, 
the snake lies quietly and waits. Attracted by what must appear to be a squirming insect, the skink draws near. The venom, five times more powerful than that of its cousin, the king cobra, paralyzes the muscles that control breathing. The Australian Reptile Park was founded by Eric Worrell, who has worked with snakes for more than 50 years. His wife, Robin, is also an experienced snake handler. She has been bitten only once in 10 years. Though her snake milking demonstration may draw curious crowds, the primary goal of her work lies in the realm of science and medicine. What I'm milking here is the mainland tiger snake. It's probably about seven or eight different types of tiger snakes in Australia. It's the third deadliest that we have in Australia. What I'm actually doing now is just enticing the snake to bite over the rubber. The fangs are penetrating through that rubber and the venom accumulates in the bottom of the beaker. Generally, we keep it in a frozen state until we have enough to accumulate and then we dry it in a desiccate or into crystallized form. Over the years, the venoms collected here have proved invaluable to laboratories developing snake bite cures. Thanks largely to the Worrell's work, there are now anti-venoms for all Australia's poisonous snakes. Australia's reptiles also include some 400 species of lizards. Lacking venom as protection against predators, they depend on some remarkable defenses. Undisturbed, the frilled lizard looks harmless enough. But in the face of an enemy, it launches an apparently ferocious counterattack. counterattack is all bluff. If it fails to discourage a persistent enemy, the frilled lizard beats a hasty retreat. The arid regions of central and western Australia are home to a creature that appears to have stepped out of the world of dinosaurs. Actually, the thorny devil is a slow-moving, ant-eating member of a group called dragon lizards. The devil has adapted to some of the continent's harshest conditions. But perhaps its most notable adaptation is its coat of spines, a barricade of daggers to deter enemies. Survival is a constant struggle in the desert. The creatures that live here have developed special adaptations to exist in the arid environment. Rainfall comes in frequently and does not linger. As the clay pans begin to dry up, the water-holding frog employs a remarkable survival technique. The frog increases its body weight by as much as 50% by absorbing water through its skin. Then it burrows a meter deep into the softened clay. Once underground, it will enter a sleep-like state. Its active life essentially over until the desert once again sees rain. Encased in a cocoon-like bag of dead skin, the frog will remain in its chamber, sealed beneath the now dry and hardened earth. In times of drought, these amazing creatures have been known to stay buried for two years or more.
Only when the rains finally come and the earth begins to soften can the frog begin to emerge. It must mate quickly so that its young will mature in time to soak up their own water supply and bury themselves until the next rains come. In the forests of southeastern Queensland, a major scientific discovery was made in 1972. Since that time, a bizarre animal unique in the world has been making history. The first noteworthy fact was that it existed at all. Australians had always believed that in their country there was no such thing as a frog that lived in water. Since the original discovery, captured animals have been sent to the zoology department of the University of Adelaide for study by Dr. Michael Tyler, one of the country's foremost experts on frogs. These frogs are the most light sensitive and shy that Tyler has ever seen. The only way he has been able to observe them successfully is to remove them from their regular aquarium. In a specially built tank with one-way glass windows, the frogs are unaware of Tyler's presence. Because many have died in captivity, and in recent years no more have been found in the wild, only these two remain to unlock the mysteries of some of the most unusual animal behavior ever recorded. Action like this free-falling is bizarre and unexplained. But it is the animal's reproduction that has most electrified the world. This gastric brooding frog carries her young in her stomach, switching off her gastric acid secretions for the duration of her pregnancy. After carrying some two dozen tadpoles for about eight weeks, the mother opens her mouth, dilates her esophagus, and the babies pop up from the stomach, one or two at a time. They sit on the mother's tongue, look around, then step gently into the world. Tyler's rare photo of an actual birth made headlines around the world. Scientists hope that these frogs will give them clues to the treatment of such stomach disorders as peptic ulcers. Tyler continues to study this one remaining pair, hoping he is not engaged in a losing race with extinction. Millions of years of isolation in Australia have protected another group of unique animals. Sharing features of both reptiles and mammals, they may offer a glimpse of how modern mammals evolved. One of these egg-laying mammals, or monotremes, is the echidna, the spiny anteater. This small, unaggressive creature has a tiny, toothless mouth at the end of its stick-like snout. In the daily search for ants, it relies solely on the long, sticky tongue as its means of getting food. The echidna's only defenses are needle-sharp spines and the ability to sink out of sight in the face of danger. The powerful echidna digs rapidly into the hard earth. Within minutes, only a forbidding shield remains above ground.
The female echidna carries a single leathery egg in a pouch that forms on her belly at the beginning of the breeding season. In about 10 days, the egg will hatch. The tiny baby nurses in the pouch for up to two months. By definition, a mammal is a warm-blooded, haired animal that suckles its young. The echidna qualifies in all respects, but it has the reptilian characteristic of laying eggs. Another monotreme dwells in the waterways of eastern Australia. Outwardly looking nothing whatever like its spiny cousin, the platypus does share the egg-laying trait. Although it is often called the duckbill platypus, its bill is actually soft, pliable, and rubbery, quite unlike a duck's. Filled with sensitive nerves, it is a specialized adaptation for feeling out the insect larvae and crayfish on which the platypus feeds. Because the platypus spends much of the time burrowed in riverbanks, little of its life cycle is known. So unlike other animals is the platypus, it was considered a hoax when discovered in the late 1700s. Layman still gazed quizzically at an animal that appears to be part mammal, part reptile, part bird. To this day, it remains a creature shrouded in mystery. Many of Australia's animals share both a mysterious past and an uncertain future as man continues to expand into former wilderness areas. Here in the Blue Mountains, an historic estate has been transformed into a private reserve for the breeding of endangered animals. The estate is owned by Peter Piggott, one of Australia's foremost conservationists. His breeding success stems from his concern for creating the most natural setting possible in a captive environment. The Parma wallaby was abundant until early settlers destroyed its habitat and introduced new predators. Many feared the wallaby had become extinct, but a small colony was discovered in 1965. Starting with only 18 animals, Piggott has increased the population here to more than 200 in 10 years. People say to me, you know, why should we conserve wildlife? Why should we be really concerned? I mean, aren't people more important than wildlife? We are all part of the 600 million years of evolution. And I suppose that one of the great things that separates mankind from the animals is our sense and appreciation of the aesthetics, our love of literature, our love of art and poetry and of nature itself. I often think that if we lose this, we disregard the world that's around us and the animals that are here. We might wake up one morning and find ourselves on the endangered list. <laughs>